back up, uh, Ed Phillips. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> See you number one. <laughs> Okay, uh, in keeping with the, the museum's emphasis this weekend, we wanted to talk about a particular type of travel error, and that would be the type R, often called the Model R, that's fine, or the mystery ship. And there's probably a half a dozen stories about how that name came about. However, I'll tell you the correct one, okay? <laughs> At least I think it's correct. But uh, the Scarlet Marvel is one of the tags that was put on the uh, Type R after it won the 1929 Thompson race, uh, just because of the brilliant colors that it was painted in. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more detail about some of the technical aspects of these airplanes, the personalities that were involved, and what drove the Travel Air Company to do this to begin with. So as we go along, and then at the end, we'll have another uh, Q&A. So this is a, a history of the famous Travel Air Type R monoplanes. And, and I could go on for 500 slides, but I haven't done that, so don't worry. <laughs> All right, this we saw a little bit before. The golden age of air racing, basically, most scholars will agree, was between 1929 and 1939. 1939, when Hitler plunged the world into war, and uh, 1929, uh, of course, was at the height of the uh, aviation business success on the commercial side, especially the small airplane commercial side. So air racing was a very popular uh, public sport. People liked to go, they would pay good money to see air races, even in the Depression, they would ante up four or five dollars for a ticket. That was a lot of money back then. You could buy what? Lots of bread, milk, and eggs with that, but they would go and see these pilots because a lot of the pilots today, or then, rather, were like the sports heroes of today, you know, like the LeBron Jameses and others of that time, and people wanted to see them fly. They were not reckless. They were extremely well-educated in what they were doing. They were brave. Uh, and they, uh, they also knew uh, what the risks were. And sure, some of them were killed over a period of time, but uh, the majority of them that knew just, to, just where to push it and no farther. But in 1928, starting this off, 1928, Walter Beach uh, was well aware of the fact that the fastest airplanes on the air racing from 1921 all the way to 1928, the military, U.S. military, Army, Navy, always won the air races because they had what? all the government behind them, lots of money, big powerful radial engines, and the best engineering in the world. So they had the top airplanes. It was hard for some of them from Wichita to compete with that. And Mr. Beach had the idea, he says, well, I think we can change that. Let's challenge these people. And so in 1928, he did that. Now, the fastest airplane on the travel air production line at that time was this one right here the type D4000, and in front of it is none other than Ted Wells. Now, Ted was from a wealthy family, tended Princeton back in New Jersey, was an early aeronautical engineering degree holder, came to Wichita, worked here as an intern for a couple of summers in 27, 28, and then he came on full time later on in 29. But he, uh, he bought this airplane in 1928 and raced very successfully with it. And it's his own airplane. And you notice, well, you can't really tell where you're at, but the ailerons on the top wing uh, tell me that this was a D4000. It was a speed wing, what Traveler called a speed wing. And instead of having a fairly thick airfoil, it was very thin. So you had less lift, but you had good speed, low drag. And what was speed? Speed was everything. Walter Beach loves speed. Clyde says he loves speed. Everybody likes speed. Anyway. Uh, so this airplane was capable of 150 miles an hour. That was fast for a travel air. Most of them were put putting along at you know, 95 to 110. This was a fast airplane. And uh, Ted Wells won some good money with this in local and regional air races here in the Midwest. But that was the fastest thing they had. So this man, Herbert Rodden, did anybody in this room ever know Herb Rodden? Personally, yeah. Great man, okay? A brilliant engineer. Um, and he approached Walter Beach in 1928 and says, you know, I have an idea for an airplane that maybe we can build and would compete in the air races. No, it didn't take very long. Mr. Beach thought about that, gave it some serious thought, because what was it going to do? It was going to take company money and resources and things like that. He said, do it. Let's go. So he just kind of backed off, and Herb Rodden uh, got started on this. So he's your chief designer of the Type R monoplane. With all respect to Ted Wells, and Ted Wells told me this, he had nothing to do with the Type R. Not a thing. Absolutely not. Uh, it was primarily Herbert Rodden and 
his sidekick here, Walter Burnham. Anyone know Walter Burnham? <coughs> sort of, okay, all right. His wife, Dorothea, uh, I interviewed her during my research for the Travel Air book a long time ago, and she mentioned how much he enjoyed working with uh, Herb Rodden on that airplane. Now, it was done uh, quietly, both of them off campus on their own time. They got no money for doing this. So they were designing this airplane because of their love of flying and their love of speed. And they wanted an airplane that could win the races and beat the military at that point. So he were, uh, Walter Burnham was very, very crucial in helping Herbert Rodden design this airplane. They went through untold iterations and configurations of how to do this. And they finally decided what they needed was an inline engine and a very narrow fuselage, thin wings, of course, and minimum drag. They looked at adding, as you'll see in a minute, you looked at adding retractable landing gear. That was okay, and that was round, that was nothing new. And they rejected it, because uh, Herb Rodden said, we can build a fixed landing gear that doesn't go up and down, that weighs less than a retractable gear, so the trade-off is worth it in weight versus speed. So that's the way they were thinking about those things. Wrong button. Okay, so this particular airplane was the final configuration that I had. Now we'll go into more detail on how they built it, but if you just look at it, you can see it's very sleek, very slender, just one cockpit, and short, thin wings, very heavily fared landing gear. And by the way, those landing gear fairings were built by hand out of soft aluminum formed by the craftsmen, and they were pretty big fairings at that time. And you'll notice that there's a minimum of struts supporting, there's a couple of struts on the upper wing, and that's basically just a center section, and the outer wings were bolted on, and then they used steel wire to brace the wing, to take the loads. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And those same wires, if you notice, run down to the landing gear and they brace the landing gear. So the whole thing is like a box structure and very rigid. But for the time, that was a step forward in aeronautical design, no question about it. And of course, Mr. Beach was very enthusiastic. According to the notes I've seen, he was very enthusiastic at what Rodden and Burnham were doing. Now, it took them quite a while to do it. They started in 1928, and they didn't get done until 1929. Now, this shot you've probably seen. A lot of people have seen this. It's one of the few shots of the first Type R under construction. Now, this is in Building C at that travel air plant that we saw earlier. And now I can tell you a little bit about the mystery ship. First off, uh, Mrs. Beach told me only a hand-picked crew were allowed into this room. That's the first thing. There was only about four or five men that were allowed in there. It was uh, cordoned off with curtains. It had sentries, <laughs> okay? Not with guns, I don't think. And uh, she said that no one was allowed in there. It was very secretive. Even she couldn't go in there without an escort at that point. Mr. Beach could go in there whenever he wanted because he wanted to go in and say, what are you guys doing? How are you doing? What's this? What's that? He's very interested. So you see what the structure is. It was not revolutionary. Instead, it's welded steel tube fuselage wooden wings, but the cowling on the engine is, a, is actually a work of art. They took the cowling and they kind of sliced it into what looked like petals. And you notice they've been pulled together and welded. Okay, so there was a lot of sanding and things like that to that cowling. I want to mention that cowling added 20 miles per hour to the finished airplane. Okay, 20 miles per hour. Uh, you'll see a picture of it without the cowling because it wasn't fully done, but the National Air, um, the NACA, rather, they had developed with Fred Wyke a pressure cowling. And it was designed to cool the engine, but it would also increase the speed of the air through the cowling and increase the speed of the airplane. So that was made generally available by NACA by 1929. And Travel Air built one uh, of their own design based on those figures, based on the performance of it. The landing gear, you can see a little bit better. Welded steel, just uh, tires, wheels. Uh, mechanical brakes on that, and then the cockpit, just a seat and a stick. So this is early in the uh, manufacturing process. The airplane that you see behind it is that sister ship. That's number two, Type R, that was built that'll have the Chevalier engine that was not a success. So this is a very uh, interesting shot early. This would be about midsummer of 1929. They were working on this thing almost 24 hours a day to get it done. Now, as far as the mystery ship is concerned, despite all this security, the Wichita press got wind that Walter Beach was building a racing airplane. Now, that's all they knew. That was enough. <laughs> so they came out to the factory, made inquiries, 
and nobody knew anything. I don't know what you're talking about. So Mr. Beach knew that would happen. What he did was he had all the windows frosted. Okay, so you can't see through them. Everybody knows what frosted windows are like. And that is verified in the uh, Travel Air Currents, which was a house organ that they published. And then there was a picture about what's going on back in Ch Factory C. Ooh, big secret. And they made a lot of play out of that for the employees. And all the windows had been frosted. The curtains were there. Nobody was allowed to go near it. So the press came out, according to one report I read, and they uh, couldn't get anything out of uh, the front office. So they put some ladders up to try and see in. Well, the windows were frosted. See, water's got you beat before you get there. Mm -hmm. And so they said in the next issue I could find down here in the library, it said, Beach is building a mystery ship out at the factory. And the name stuck. And that's where it really came from, a mystery ship. So it's nothing wrong with that. It's a good name for it, actually. But uh, it was held in great secrecy. So the second airplane that was built, again, was uh, R-2002. They had their own serial numbers, by the way, R-2001, 2, 3, 4, 5. There was only five of them built. And this second one was registered R-613 Kilo and had the Chevalier engine. Now, the gentleman in the cockpit, i got to mention, that's Clarence Clark. Did anyone ever know Clarence Clark here? I've got a feeling probably not. Okay, Clarence Clark was hired in 1926 by uh, Walter Beach to be a test pilot at Travelair. He, uh, he had learned to fly uh, during the war, but he wasn't a military pilot. He was a very good pilot. He was very soft-spoken. My wife and I interviewed him down in Bartlesville a number of times for the Travel Air book. He was very, very nice guy to talk to. Didn't draw attention to himself or anything, but he was the chief test pilot at Travel Air. And uh, he's in the cockpit there. He's just a young man in his early 20s. And he was strapping on these really powerful racing airplanes. He'd been flying OX-5 Jennies before he came to Travel Air, and he's been testing. Now, he test, flew, he test flew well over 600 airplanes during his time with Travel Air and signed them off as OK for delivery. So he's, a, he's flying this airplane, and I'll talk a little bit about more of some of the comments he had on it a little later. So again, the factory where these airplanes were built is in the, in the lower left right there next to that uh, outside heating building. You can see it. And that was all frosted away so you couldn't see anything. So that was the secretive part about it. Then in August of 1929, here's the airplane, the first one, 614 kilo with the 420 horsepower, specially built, supercharged right radial engine, an R975. And because of the fact that Curtis Wright by now had absorbed travel air into its business, and Walter needed to get an engine. What they found out was that the Chevalier, which is what Herb Rodden originally wanted, was supposed to put out 400 horsepower. It couldn't even make 200. Not only that, but it burned more oil than gasoline. That didn't work too well. So uh, Rodden said, we've got to find something else. Mr. Beach went to work. He called Guy Vaughn, who was the president over at Wright, because they were all in the same company now. He said, we need an engine. OK, I'm simplifying this. OK, how much horsepower? I want 420 horsepower. I want supercharged. I want one, only one. Only one like it in the world. OK, we'll build it. They built it and sent it to them. And uh, 420 horsepower at that point with a minimum weight and supercharged, was, as a, that was a pretty nice engine to hang on the front of that travel air. So this is Herb Rodden, by the way, at the first engine start. Clarence Clark's in the cockpit. And they spent probably a couple of weeks just working on the airplane on the ground to make sure it was OK, the fuel system, the oil systems, everything was going to work OK before Clarence took it up for the first time. So that's an interesting photo. That's about as clean as the airplane ever was. After this, it wasn't going to be very clean. Now here's Clarence flying the airplane. Soon after that other photograph, in flight, and you notice the cowling's not on. So you can get a good idea what it looked like. Kind of ugly that way, you know? But that, that cowling streamlined everything out. You'll notice on the landing wires between the wing and the landing gear, you see the, you see the grass trailing behind. It's because everybody used grass strips at that time. And I asked Clarence this question. I said, Mr. Clark, what was it like to fly that airplane? <laughs> and he said, oh, I never felt such power. You know, I never felt such power. So I got up on the runway, and I eased that throttle forward. And when it started moving, I just moved it on up. So it pushed me back in that seat like you couldn't believe. And he said, it was fantastic. And I said, OK, thanks. Can I quote you on that? Yeah, all right. <laughs> so here he is flying this airplane. Therefore, after it was all done, um, the uh, Clarence Clark flew it up to Cleveland. 
And here we see it at Cleveland. Now, Walter Beach needed a pilot. This was important. Clarence wasn't a race pilot, so he wasn't going to use him. He ended up using Doug Davis. He was a travel air dealer in Atlanta, Georgia, long-time racing pilot. And since he had an affiliation with Travel Air, he was the one that Walter hired to fly the airplane. He knew how to do pylon racing. Pylon racing was, yes, semi-dangerous. You had to know what you were doing. But this airplane was built specifically to pull high G loads on pylons and go fast. So you say, well, how fast was it? Clarence told me that with the cowling on, he easily hit 230. No problem. Now, well, at that time, the military was up around those speeds, too. But remember, who's got less drag? The biplane from the military or the travel air? Well, the travel air, clearly, and a whole lot less weight. This airplane, you know, was very low weight as well. So the power to weight ratio was fantastic, which is what Clarence kept talking about all the time. So um, in, order to, uh, in order to fly the airplane, you got Doug Davis to do that. And once the Thompson, it was not the Thompson trophy race yet. It was just the free for all event. Uh, is on the last day of the National Air Races at Cleveland, which lasted a whole week, so you kind of kept everybody in suspense. And you had the likes of uh, Roscoe Turner and other famous racing pilots who were there, all vying up against this, and the military. I'll show you what the military brought to Cleveland, thinking, no problem, we're going to crush this travel air. It's not going to be any com competition for us at all. But Doug Davis was able to win, and I wanted to mention that first, and that shows you the Thompson Cup. And the next year it became the Thompson Trophy, and continued on until the war started. And then it was picked up again after the war. And you notice that Doug Davis always flew in a suit. Even when he flew the race, he flew in a suit. And you notice a little dirty, though. You know, kind of dirty after getting out of that travel air. So, so after the race was over, this is a picture of the airplane, of course, before the race, but sitting there at Cleveland. And the press was just swarming. When Mr. Beach had the airplane, when he came in, he was already at Cleveland. Clarence Clark landed the airplane. Mr. Beach had it all set up. He had a hanger, and he just said, get it in there. And they taxied that in there, and they put a cover over top of it and closed the doors. <laughs> this is just wonderful Walter Beach. This is Walter Beach to the, to the T. You know, build that excitement, that wow factor. And uh, so nobody could get to see it until it rolled out on that seventh day of the races to do the uh, Thompson free-for-all. So again, a very attractive airplane. You can see how thin the wings are at that point. Here's the competition. Now look at the difference. Yeah, very different. Still had a 400 plus horsepower radial engine just like Walter's airplane, but it was just simply, it had taper wings, fast wings, fast airplane, 200 mile an hour airplane, sure, but it's not gonna be able to compete with the Travel Air on the pylons, and that's where the Travel Air was built to do that. So. It was a Curtis, Curtis, a modified Curtis from the Army. So uh, once uh, the race began, uh, Doug Davis quickly pulled out into the lead, left everybody in the dust, including the military, went around the pylons, went around the pylons, went around the pylons. On the, it was usually, sometimes it was a 100 mile, or 100 mile race, sometimes a little bit less, and it was a very tight, closed course. He thought he cut a pylon once, which means he turned inside of it. So he went around it, and he wasn't sure if he did it that time, so he went around again, and still everybody was way behind him. Yeah, it's interesting. So he won easily, 194.5 miles per hour, average speed. Okay? And the military was a distant second. That infuriated the Army, I can tell you that. You can read about it in the papers. They were just disgusted. Not only that, but the brass went, a what beat us? A who from where? You know, that was, that kind of, that was the way it was. So travel area, put them on the map. Curtis Wright then took the airplane away from the factory after he did a little tour, and they put Dale Red Jackson, he's the guy in the cockpit, a very competent pilot, and they flew it around the country on a tour. So that's why it says Curtis Wright Exhibition Company on the, on the side. And he just flew it and took it to air shows and did little speed passes and aerobatics with it. So for the rest of the summer and into the autumn of 29, that was what it was doing. And it did it very successfully. People were amazed. So wherever the Scarlet Marvel went, people would show up to see it. Later on, um, the uh, airplane was damaged in a landing during, with Curtis Wright. Curtis Wright took it, I have a photograph of it, and they put it in a hangar, and they decided they were just going to destroy it. That was it. But it wasn't that badly damaged. But it was in pieces. Walter Hunter bought it. 
He would sell me the airplane. He was just a, a low time, uh, not very experienced racing pilot, but he had the money. He bought the airplane, had his engineering friends work on it, and they modified it into uh, a different airplane. This is what it looked like. Well, he said, it doesn't look too different. No, it doesn't, but it's got a bigger engine, a different cowling, and uh, some uh, airframe modifications to take the higher power uh, that this particular engine produced. And he tried to win the 1931 Bendix, but failed to do that. The airplane just simply had too many technical problems. It was not worked out properly before the race. And uh, in the end, uh, 614 Kilo caught fire in the air when he was at the air races, and the flames were coming up in the cockpit. He had to bail out, and he did. He bailed out very low, something order order of less than 500 feet. And the airplane just went in and was destroyed. That was the end of the first Type R. However, I need to add that the uh, Tullahoma Museum, the Staggerwing Museum Foundation down in Tullahoma, has uh, a replica of this airplane that incorporates some of the original parts, believe it or not, but just not there were many. And it looks beautiful. It looks just like the original airplane when it rolled out of the factory, but it's, it's not the same airplane. But they were also able to get the 614 kilo registration for it from the FAA. So they tout it as about the closest thing to the real Type R 614 kilo, and I agree with that. That's okay. So the first airplane really made uh, uh, an impression. I want to tell you about a story that I cannot confirm, but it sounds really good. <laughs> Walter Beach went around before the race uh, that day, and he made bets with everybody. How much? Who do you think is going to win? How do you think we're going to do? He took a lot of money, thousands of dollars. And that's how confident he was in the airplane. Well, it easily won, and of course those other guys paid up. Now what did he do with the money? He shared it with the people at Travel Air. He didn't keep it. Let's talk a little bit about the poor poster child here. 613 Kilo with a Chevrolet engine. How many of you drive Chevrolets? One? That's all? <laughs> Even I drive a Chevrolet. OK. All right. 613 Kilo, it, at the air races, it performed very poorly. The engine would not produce power. It was uh, blowing smoke out the exhaust and everything else. Clarence Clark tried to fly it, and he told Mr. Beach, this thing is just not going to cut it. So Mr. Beach had it withdrawn. He didn't want any bad PR. So they dismantled it, put it in a railroad car, sent it back here. And he said, we'll deal with it when we get back after the races. So that uh, airplane did not last very long with that engine in that original configuration. What they decided to do was rebuild it and put a right engine on it, a right radial engine, which they did, a J67, 240 horsepower, not as powerful as the original Type R, but uh, other than that, identical to it, essentially, but not without a cowling. And when Pancho Barnes, who was a very flamboyant pilot in California, um, lady pilot, when she heard about it, she went to uh, Travel Air and she approached Olive Ann Miller about that and was able to talk to Mr. Beach. She said, I want to buy the airplane. Now, she was not uh, an easy person to deal with. She, was, she had a strong personality, um, but she was a very confident pilot. They sold her the airplane in that configuration right there. And this is a picture of her after the cowling was added. She made a number of speed attempts with this airplane, but its most famous role was in a Howard Hughes film called Hell's Angels. Anybody ever heard of that? This airplane provided the second version of the film. Remember, he made one that was silent. And then when the sound technology came, he goes, well, I can't release a silent film. They shot the whole movie over again. But all the passes that you hear with the machine guns going are this airplane and that right radial engine. She flew past the microphones out in LA, exactly the way that uh, Hughes people told her to do that. So it has some claim to fame. Now, in the 1940s, uh, in the 50s, the airplane looked like this. It was owned by Paul Mance, who was a very famous pilot. Um, if you ever saw Flight of the Phoenix, uh, that movie, he was the one who flew that odd-looking airplane, which unfortunately, during the movie, it crashed and he was killed. But he was an excellent pilot and very careful about his risks, but that airplane was not good. But anyway, he modified this airplane a number of times, and since then, it changed hands a number of times, and now, it is, uh, to the best of my knowledge, although it's kept quiet, it's still in England. It was rebuilt in England, sent over to England, and someone whose name we will never know because they don't want it known has paid a lot of money to have some British craftsmen rebuild this airplane. Now, whether it'll ever come back here or not, I don't know. I've still got my ear to the ground. 
about it. But uh, it would look fabulous when it's done. Incidentally, there's probably a dozen replicas of these airplanes that are flying that are just built from plans um, that were done. And, and they're great representations because they're modern airplanes and they look like the Type R's, but they're very safe, different type of airplane underneath. The next one, R2003, was uh, built to the specifications of James Harold Doolittle. I think we all know who Doolittle, from the famous Doolittle raid in 1942. Jimmy Doolittle was an ace pilot, a uh, good air racing pilot also. And in 1930, Shell Oil Company, he convinced them to get one of these airplanes so they could do good public relations with it. Because what did Shell do? They're in the oil business, and they wanted to produce and uh, promote their aviation fuels. So they used this airplane to do that. It was registered NR-482 to the Shell Oil Company in 1930. Doolittle came to Travel Air, spent some time here. He had a long list. I've got the list of all the modifications he wanted done to the original airplane design, which is incorporated in here. Again, a powerful uh, 400 horsepower plus right radial engine, same cowling. Looks a lot alike, but it's got a lot of special equipment in there for Shell that doesn't show. Here's a little view of the airplane as it was being built. And you can see the landing gear a little bit better in the engine. That's plywood on the fuselage with tape. And the fuel tanks are right here between these two uh, struts. You can see the aluminum tank up there. The shock absorbers on the landing gear, which were oil and springs working together. So it's a, again, this wasn't a secret anymore, but there was just one crew that built all five of those airplanes because they had the experience. They, they were there from day one building the Type R's. I like this shot because this shows the airplane after Clarence Clark, who was crawling out of the cockpit, made the first test flight. And the engine's still running, just throttled back, and he gets out, and that's James H. Doolittle there in the parachute, standing on the ground, about to get in and go, ring it out, as he said. And I wrote to Mr., or I should say General Doolittle, and fortunately he was kind enough to write back to me several times, and I sent him a book, and I asked him about some things, and uh, he said, this was a marvelous airplane to fly. As soon as I got in, he said, and took off, I said, man, this is good. This is designed right, you could tell. And he wasn't necessarily going to race it, but he was going to use it to promote those fuels and do cross-country flights and things like that because he was a spokesman also for uh, Shell. So he liked the airplane a lot. His uh, associate there at Shell was uh, James Hazlip, who was also a well-known pilot air racing pilot. He is the one who mainly flew it at some of the races. Doolittle didn't always have time to do that, so Jimmy Doolittle, or excuse me, Jimmy Hazlip was assigned the airplane and uh, competed at different races. So it didn't change much in configuration there, but he's uh, holding on to a trophy that he won with the airplane. So it was still winning races. It was still kind of up in the headlines around the country. And this is a shot that's a little dark that uh, Mr. Hazlip sent me that shows him at the 1930 National Air Races. This is one year after the Scarlet Marvel and Doug Davis won. Um, and the, uh, the airplane was entered into the uh, Thompson Trophy race, which is what it was called by then. Now you notice that it's got a little canopy on it that it didn't have before, and there's a great big basketball-sized hole in there. I'm not going to ask you what that was for, I'll just tell you. Hazlip said the pyrolin that they used back then was not real clear. And he said, for me to sight the pylons when I'm coming in to make a turn, I just punched a hole in it, you know, <laughs> before the race. So I could stick my head out and see where the pylon was. So that's exactly why that's got a hole in it. <laughs> and he, um, he, uh, the shell people cooked up a brew, he called it, of super duper fantastic fuel. Not, nothing standard about it. This was wicked stuff. And it was not quite right. And the engine lost about 10 or 15 horsepower. And he was leading the race, but eventually the engine began to lose power and he ended up second, took second. Uh, or they would have won two years in a row. However, guess who beat them? Matty Laird. <laughs> Matty Laird, remember Matty? Yep, went up and built custom racing airplanes and he built a biplane uh, with a 400 plus horsepower engine and uh, Speed Holman from Minneapolis was the pilot and he just nicked out uh, Hazlip at the end. Just the way it goes. All right. Now, after the uh, airplane flew the NAR, it was damaged in an accident. Doolittle bought it. Shell didn't want to fix it. 
Doolittle bought it, and he said, I, don't, I dipped deep into my life savings to buy that airplane, and it was in pieces. And I was going to turn it into a racing airplane, and that's how I was going to make money. Okay, so he was, uh, he was still with Shell, but this was not a Shell project. He took this down to Parks Air College near St. Louis and had the students modify it. Now, Doolittle was an aeronautical engineer, a graduate aeronautical engineer, and there were very few of them, even in 1930 who knew what they were doing. So they modified the wings. They did a lot of modification to the structure underneath, and you'll see that in a minute. So this shows some of the students working on it. He put a huge 500 plus horsepower radial engine on it, stressed everything out so that it would be able to handle those loads. So when it rolled out of the factory, it looked like this. Now you say, well, it doesn't look a whole lot different. Well, yeah, it does, because you'll notice there's no struts above the wing anymore. And that was all redone and beefed up into a solid structure. And this, is, this was taken after it was rolled out and on its first flight. And by the way, it's last. <laughs> Tell you what happened. So it was resplendent in its orange and, and red scallop paint. It must have been a beautiful thing. And there's Doolittle in a typical pose. He almost always put his hands on his hips when he was talking or getting his picture taken. And he put a little canopy. You notice it slides forward so he can get in and out, and then he can close it. So he took off on the flight. This is a well-known story. He took off on the flight, did a little checking on how the airplane handled, and then he decided to make a nice low-speed pass across the field to impress everybody. These guys helped build him the airplane. So here it is before that, that high-speed pass. So he's high over St. Louis area, checking the airplane out, really pleased with it. It was fast. So what he did, we don't have any pictures of that, of course, no movie that I've ever seen. He came down over the field really fast, and just as he was pulling up, the whole airplane just and the ailerons blew off the wings. I mean, blew off the wings. They didn't just fall off, they blew off the wings, is what he said. And he goes, uh-oh. So he slid that canopy, and he rolled the airplane upside down, and he fell out. He just got out, because he knew there's no control left with it. And he opened his parachute about, it opened about 200 feet above the ground, and he hit the ground pretty hard. The airplane went in, of course, and ended up looking like this. Totally destroyed. And guess what went up in flames with it? Almost all of his life savings. He told me his wife cried for hours. Well, that's the aviation business, right? Okay, so that's what the end of 2003. Had a pretty short career, only a few years. Actually, more like two. Then number four. Well, if Shell had an airplane, the competitor Texaco's, well, we gotta have an airplane. So they send Frank Fox out to, California, to uh, Wichita with a long list of modifications, and they want R2004 built to those specifications. And Frank Hawks was a well-known pilot by then, had a number of cross-country, uh, cross-continental records to his credit, and was very well-known. And he was also one of those pilots who could talk to the press, did a really good job with the press. He was a good talking head. And as I mentioned, he understood airplanes, he understood structure, he understood performance, he understood risk, and how to balance those out. So this airplane also has a 400 plus horsepower right radial engine. Um, not too many modifications, but except you'll notice right behind the cockpit there's more of a hump. This is what I call the infamous hump. There's been more debate between scholars as to why the hump was there. It was a simple reason. He had an extra little sliding fairing on top, and when he pulled it back it had to fare into the fuselage, which is a little higher than the other airplanes, so they just fared it in. And you can see that quite uh, comfortably. Now, Hawks specifically, and I have a copy of his letter to the government, he says, I want a superstitious number on my airplane. And since this is the 13th airplane in Texaco's fleet, I want NR 1313. I don't want it once, I want it twice. <laughs> and, and that was the way he was. And they said, okay, fine, here you can have it. So he's got it. NR, and the N is, in, is of course, for the United States. R is restricted. Nobody could fly in this airplane but the pilot. And 1313. So this is the original livery. And it was a beautiful Sherwin-Williams colors uh, on the airplane when he came to get it in 1930, not too, diff not too long after Doolittle had flown away with the Shell airplane. This is another view. I think this view gives you an idea. If you notice, like the Coke bottle type fuselage there, how it's fared in. And Rodden and Burnham figured out, we've got this huge radio. How do we minimize drag? And they just uh, brought the fuselage up at the front as close as they could to the dimensions of the cowling, and then they tapered it down. That cockpit is incredibly small, and it's a good claim Clarence Clark was only this high and about that wide, all right? And he fit in there just fine. But um, he flew the first one, he flew the second one, he flew Doolittle's airplane, and he test flew this one, all right? So he's the only pilot in history to fly four out of five of the Type R's. 
and he pronounced it ready to go. So uh, at this point, Hawks took the airplane, he flew it for a few days, and on one of the flights, he had an engine failure. And he made it back to Travel Airfield, and he had to go either above the electric lines on East Central or below them. And he tried to go below them, but it caught the tail, and the airplane nosedived in. You can see the crunch in the front, you can see the crunch, and then it flipped over and collapsed the vertical stabilizer. He was injured, but not seriously. He spent about two weeks in a Wichita hospital, mending up. So, of course, then he said, Walter, you've got to get, rebuild my airplane. Rebuild it. I'll get out of the hospital. I've got to have it. So they did. And Mr. Beach put a special crew on this airplane, and they rebuilt it in record time. Since they didn't have a whole lot to do, And when they were done, it looked like this. Different paint scheme, still had the Texaco number 13 and everything, but um, a little different paint scheme. Now he rebuilt and repainted that and was re-delivered to him and he began to fly it on cross country records. Uh, to make a long story short, he set more than 200 intercity records with this airplane in, in 1930 and 1931. And he also, um, Eric has a nice uh, video up on the next floor there, fourth floor, of him standing in front of this airplane talking to the press. And he says, this airplane is capable of more than 230 miles per hour. And I advocate that we not send any letters by the mail anymore, you send it by airplane. Now that spawned a, a phrase that you see in magazines and it said, don't send it by mail, send it by hawks. <laughs> so he was trying to do it. He also took this airplane to Europe in 1931 and he set multiple records there. And it was while it was in Europe that he was in Italy and General Balbo of the Italian Air Force saw that and it was just enamored. It was nothing compared to what they had. Uh, they had still flying World War I airplanes. So he ordered uh, an identical copy of this airplane. I'll talk about that in a minute. Here's Frank, all bundled up for his uh, flying next to Texaco number 13. Frank Monroe Hawks, again, was a, uh, a gentleman and uh, Bit of a show off maybe, but you know, it was okay. A lot of those pilots were like that, but he was very careful and knew exactly what he was doing out there. He tried to race this in the Thompson, but uh, somebody put the fuel cap on wrong and it didn't vent the tank and the engine quit. So he had to land it successfully, but he tried. Here's one of those transcontinental speed dashes in August of 1930. He took the airplane, went coast to coast in 14 hours. That was fast, 14 hours, not bad. Um, in the next year, Doolittle would cut that down to 12 in a, in a Matty Laird airplane, by the way, and then it just continued to fall. You know, it just got shorter and shorter and shorter. When the more powerful metal monoplanes came out later on, it was no competition. But at this time, Frank Hawks was immensely popular. If you look at the magazines of that era, uh, and I've done a lot of that, he figures prominently, and this airplane figures prominently in ads. Texaco really milked it good for their particular uh, advantage. But it was tough flying. He didn't even get out of the cockpit. He had crews ready. They fueled the airplane, gave him some milk and a sandwich. And as soon as it was done, cleaned the windshield, and away he went. You know, so he was sitting in that thing for 14 hours, going night and day, you know, going across the country. This is a good view of the uh, sliding cockpit enclosure with Fra uh, Frank Hawks inside. And you can see how it mates up to the hump, the so-called hump. And they called him the king of speed. And in Europe, he was widely feted because the airplane was fast. And this is taken in Europe. Uh, it's either France or England. I believe it's England, if I remember the slide correctly. And you can see, uh, I believe that's a Clem in the background, which was a, a German airplane. But he flew this all up and down Europe, and they were just amazed at the speed. And they had nothing to even remotely compare to it. However, the airplane's end came in April 1932 when Hawks was taking off at a field that he was familiar with and it was just a little bit late getting off and the landing gear caught on a barbed wire fence. And that just flipped it over. He was seriously injured this time, spent a long time recovering. And you can see the airplane is badly damaged. So it was beyond what you would call economical repair is the term they used. So the airplane was rebuilt but it was basically gutted down to a shell. And if you ever go to Chicago, you can see it hanging in the Science and Industry Museum. I think the name kind of changes from time to time, but that's what it was when I did this. So there it is, so it's all rebuilt, uh, but there's nothing inside at all. 
So at least we've got the airplane to remember. So that's the only, the only real type R that exists. All the rest are replicas. So even though it's gutted and it's hanging up in the air, at least you can see it. So what happened next? Now, as I said, General Balbo wanted an identical copy. Look at this, even the paint scheme. Right down to the paint scheme. So R2005, the last airplane built, by the way, the, the Travel Air Factory was almost closed by that time. Newman and Truman Wadlow, the twins, told me in interviews, they worked on this airplane and did some flight testing on it, and there was almost nobody around. The buildings were almost all locked up. It was just something they had to finish in order to deliver it and get some money for Curtis Wright. And Walter Beach came up and checked on their progress occasionally from St. Louis, and uh, he wanted to get Clarence Clark back, because Clarence had left the company and gone to Phillips Petroleum in Bartlesville to fly for them. Clarence said, no, I'm not coming back. I got a good job. I can't got time. So he said, okay, Newman and Truman, you fly this airplane and get it straightened out. We got to deliver it. The Italian lieutenant was on site at the time, and uh, he just loved the airplane, uh, but they had to get it delivered. So MM-185 is what the Italians called it. It has nothing to do with travel there, but again, you can see the identical almost paint scheme to Frank Hawks, even down to the little sliding canopy on top. Okay. That was the Regia Aeronautica in August of 1931. What they did with it, uh, when they got it, this is a picture of Newman test flying the airplane here at the Travel Air Plant. What they did, they just used it to copy things, you know, new technology. How did they do this? Let's see if we could replicate that. They did a lot of speed tests with it. They did a lot of, they thought about turning it into a fighter. They said, hey, this is a good fighter platform. No more biplanes, we can do it. Well, that doesn't work too well when you try to make a racing airplane into a fighter. This it doesn't turn out good, and it didn't. But uh, nevertheless, I remember when I was talking to Newman, he said, I used to have to crank the seat way up. He wasn't very tall, so he could crank it way up so he could see where he was going when he was taxiing, and then when he was ready to take off, he'd crank it way down, you know, and then slide that little canopy up. So that was an interesting story. But he was only in his early 20s, and he's got a hold of this, one of the fastest airplanes in the world. I mean, that was to, it was a thrill for them. Here's a picture of the cockpit. It's one of the few photos we have that is, we know is a Type R when it was being built. That's the key. And there's a number of things there that you can see. Uh, in the upper uh, left side of the, of the instrument panel, it's a slide rule. For what? Time, fuel, distance calculations. Those guys knew how to do that. They would just sit there and make those slides during the flight and figure out what they were doing. And down at the bottom left is a fire extinguisher for the engine compartment. If the engine compartment caught fire, they could open that up and it would shoot some, uh, hopefully, uh, put out the fire. There was a little Burgess battery down at the bottom, and that powered all the little teeny light bulbs in the instrument panel at night. So it's just a dry cell battery. And then you had the other fire extinguisher right here on the seat frame in case there was a fire in the cockpit. Okay? You just took it off of there and you sprayed it around, hope it went out. So you never had to use that, fortunately. But that was a very state-of-the-art cockpit for the time. Today, you know, with the, with the Bonanzas and the Barons and the King Airs and all that, it's all glass cockpits and all that. Well, this was state-of-the-art back then. He had a lot of uh, good technology. The other thing you don't see here is that he had, do you remember Felix the Cat, the little cartoon character? He had one, and he used to hang it on the instrument panel whenever he flew. So you see some pictures of the airplane with Felix the Cat hanging there, and that was his little uh, mascot. Uh, the final test flights here in the U.S. before it was uh, dismantled and shipped by uh, water over to Italy was L.G. Larson. He was just a local pilot. He finished up the flight testing. Newman and Truman were going off to other jobs. There was just nobody left at Travel Air. It was a sad state. You walk in that place and you could hear a pin drop. And a year before, you couldn't build airplanes fast enough. So, anyhow, this airplane was destroyed eventually by the Italians in 1939. They had no further use for it, so they totally destroyed it, unfortunately. So here's one of the replicas. You can see the great likeness and similarity. There's at least 10 or 12 of these. There's, there's two or three in Europe, I think, now that are either being built or are flying. So it's a very popular design for the replica builders. So they're keeping the legacy alive. Now, any questions or comments about anything. Steve? Well, I don't see how they had adequate forward visibility like in an air race to see the pylons 
or to see to take off and land. You were talking about cranking the seat up, mm -hmm. the taxi. Yeah. Obviously, you're in a very nice nose high attitude for that, but even at racing speed, I don't see how you could see forward. You couldn't really very well. You looked out the side of this airplane, this type of airplane. Other airplanes had more of a canopy and you could see better, but that's just one of the prices they paid for it. They knew the course and they knew about where they were going to have to start to turn. And once they went around at one time, they were okay. Well, you're right, there wasn't a whole lot of forward visibility. Not on the, not on the Type R, and it was a very high, nose high attitude as well, but they were used to that. See, that was one of the things. That's a good question. Another question. John. Did Herb Walton ever comment on the fact that uh, all the successful aircraft have radials and his original design was inline? Yeah, yeah, he was trying to go with that inline because he thought, oh good, narrow drag. No, not less drag, but he just didn't have the power. So the, he was forced to turn to that, but that was good because that's where everybody was going anyway. Good question. Anything else? Eric, I think uh, everybody wants to get up. <laughs> I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for letting me tell you these things. Very good.